Dear Ambassador Linda Thomas Greenfield, welcome to the Africa Center um, for this special day, Africa Day, um, for my first interview as a director of the Africa Center and with you as a special guest and what a guest. Thank you for the honor. Thank you for the time and for your upcoming thoughts. Um, since I have a foot on, on three continents, welcome to our African, French, European and American attendees. Uh, Ambassador Thomas Greenfield, um, I mean, I, I think you maybe do you remember last time we met in front of ASG Elevator. You told me about your wish to step down to look to look after your grandchild, uh, be involved in Biden's campaign. Biden, who was not seen as the next winner at that moment, and now he's a president, and you are here, U.S. Ambassador to the UN. Just uh, that's uh, an easy question to answer, but let me start first by congratulating you uh, for taking on this amazing uh, position at the Atlantic Council and to wish you the best of luck as you work on issues that we both are very, very passionate about across the continent of Africa. So the simple uh, answer to your question, what happened? Uh, what happened is the American speak, people spoke and uh, elected uh, President uh, Biden, and uh, he surprised me and asked uh, for me to be uh, his uh, ambassador to the United Nations. So that caught me uh, completely off guard, uh, but I think I, uh, he found a place that is very much in my comfort zone. Yeah, that's right. And as you can see, it is the start, it is a conversation, um, maybe like a fireside chat uh, through this cold screen, more than an interview. But um, I have a few questions about, first about your career maybe, undoubtedly a solid career of diplomat, 35 years with the US Foreign Office, Assistant Secretary uh, of State for African Affairs, Ambassador to Liberia, postings everywhere in Africa, um, lead, Africa practice lead at World Rights Solid Group, distinguished fellow in African studies at uh, Georgetown University. No one can doubt of your African commitment. Um, and as an African woman, I noticed African nations were the first to, to welcome you, to welcome your awesome achievement. And my first question is very simple. Uh, what explains uh, your, your African commitment? Yeah, which African countries have most impressed you um, as, as ambassador, will you do what Africans are not familiar with these last years, prioritize Africa in your mission? Uh, that's a wonderful uh, question, uh, Ambassador. You know, I, um, I, I went to Africa uh, for the very first time when I was uh, 26 years old uh, and I went to Liberia uh, to study and I fell in love with the continent uh, at that point. I fell in love with Liberia, so clearly Liberia is, is going to be listed as the, the country that is my favorite country on the continent, but I actually fell in love with the continent, and I fell in love with the continent because it's so clear when you look at me, that is where I'm from, that's my, uh, that is where my roots are, are, are from, I'm an African. Uh, and uh, had uh, my ancestors not been brought here as slaves, I would have grown up uh, likely as a Nigerian uh, because my ancestry.com uh, uh, told me that I, I'm about 48% uh, Nigerian. Uh, so I realized very, very quickly when I, when I went to the continent that, uh, that there, there was a, an emotional attachment there. The fact that I eventually ended up studying Africa and, and making Africa as a continent my professional focus uh, is very much related to that personal connection uh, that I have uh, to the continent. And there are co countries all over the continent that have tremendous uh, potential. Uh, but I always like to point out Liberia. And the reason is Liberia went through such a horrific uh, experience of civil war 
uh, where children uh, saw their parents killed and parents saw their children killed. And uh, Liberia eventually came out of that war, uh, electing the first woman ever to be elected a president on the continent of Africa. And even before we've elected a woman uh, in, the, in the United States. Uh, and she came with a, a firm commitment uh, to helping uh, Liberia become uh, normal again and helping children uh, find a future that was not marred by uh, the sound of gunfire. Uh, and so I was very much a part of that rebuilding that uh, President Sirleaf uh, led uh, as the U.S. ambassador to Liberia from 2008 to 2012. And I'm very proud of what uh, we were able to uh, accomplish there. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, lucky Nigerians to have you. Uh, you stressed um, the changes on the continent. Uh, you have had the time during your career uh, to see tremendous changes on the African continent. Um, as I'm used to say, the oldest continent, the youngest population, the largest population soon in the world, home to, the, to many of the fastest growing economies in the world. The, the biggest digital um, um, revolution of these two decades and beyond COVID, terrorism and poverty, do you think that Washington under this new Biden presidency uh, can look at Africa in a different way, more in line uh, with, with the realities of the, uh, on the ground as a land of opportunities and not only a land of risks? Uh, absolutely. And that is uh, a question that was made for me uh, because I do feel and I know that the Biden administration understands that Africa offers tremendous opportunities and that uh, there are success stories in the making on this continent. And there are resources on this continent that are yet to be tapped and used for, uh, for the population. So while I am not uh, uh, going to ignore the challenges, we know what those challenges are we know that we need to focus on the opportunities. We need to look at the fact that before COVID, Africa had the largest number of the fastest growing countries uh, in the world. Uh, six or seven or eight countries were among those fastest growing countries in, in the world. We know that in order for those countries to come back, that they need to diversify their economies, they need to rebuild their capacity, and they need to harness the extraordinary opportunity that their youth uh, provide for them, being the youngest uh, continent in terms of the medium age on the continent being uh, around 19 uh, years uh, old. Uh, so there are opportunities in, in, in terms of uh, promoting and encouraging and, and mentoring that young population. And as we move into uh, this next uh, decade on the continent of Africa, those, those resources that we see on the continent can be used to build this continent into a place that we can all be proud of uh, being a part of. Yes, yes, of course. Um, and what, what, what strikes me most uh, these last days, uh, uh, years, Ambassador, is um, I, I often have the feeling that uh, Western countries regard Africa as an interesting land through Chinese eyes. But uh, as you just uh, told us, uh, Africa is interesting, is strategic, Chinese or not Chinese. Um, but yes, we cannot ignore uh, the, the challenges. And um, among those challenges, uh, there is the matter of democracy. Um, an Afrobarometer survey across 34 countries uh, found that 68% of Africans think uh, democracy is the best um, system of government. But moving democracy from paper to a practice is, is a challenge. Um, what should the U.S. be doing to support that majority of Africans who wish to see democracy take hold? And um, this question um, that is asked by many Africans, um, after the insurrection at the Capitol, how can the U.S. credibly raise this challenge to, to Africans, but um, also for the rest of the world? 
Well, we strongly believe, and Africans have affirmed that, that democracy is the best way forward for the continent of Africa. It allows people to go uh, to the polls and express their views and vote for the person that they think can lead them into uh, a life of, of prosperity. And Africans know that. What is lacking sometimes, to be very frank with you, is leadership. Leadership that is committed to, to the people. And that's something that's a work in progress across the continent. As for the events that took place on January 6th, uh, it was heartbreaking for all of us uh, to see that attack on our capital, that attack on our democracy and on our values. But what we also saw that very same day we saw our institutions stand strong. We saw our Congress come back into the chambers and finish the work that they'd started on the same day that they started that, that work. And so it shows that strong institutions can stand against any attack and our institutions stood strong on that day. And that's what Africans need to uh, take from the experience that happened in, in the United States. What happened shows that our country is not perfect. Uh, we showed our imperfections for the entire world to see, but we also showed our strength to the entire world. And we showed our ability, our resilience uh, to stand up against those kinds of attacks. Yeah, the democracy is not only the leader, but the institution as well. Um, and everything held, uh, that's a lesson, yeah. Um, there is one country um, that is, uh, it, it, it's heartbreaking for me uh, to, 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 to mention that country because it's not, uh, it's not simple. It's Ethiopia, Tigray, a country where democracy is, is being challenged right now. Um, and there has been a strong US rhetoric on, on, on Tigray. Um, my question is, what about the policy? Uh, can you tell us about your, your understanding of the situation on the ground, as well as the allegations of atrocities and, and continued denial of, of humanitarian access? You know, we're truly, truly uh, saddened and horrified uh, by the situation uh, in Ethiopia uh, as we speak. Um, Ethiopia was seen as, as a country that was on the rise. Uh, it was a country that many countries were trying to uh, emulate. It was among those fastest growing countries on the continent of Africa. And the new president, uh, who uh, the new prime minister was seen as uh, one of those new uh, generation of leaders that would help uh, the country move forward. So the situation in Tigray was extraordinarily uh, disappointing. Uh, to have that situation happen in Ethiopia at, at this time. As far as U.S. policy is concerned, I, I think I can clearly say and hopefully lead this audience understanding that what we have been doing in Ethiopia is not just rhetoric. We have been engaged diplomatically and aggressively diplomatically. The president sent his own emissary uh, to meet with, uh, with the prime minister. Uh, Senator Coons went out there, met with the prime minister, passed uh, uh, strong messages, got commitments from uh, the prime minister. And we saw that some of those commitments were uh, honored, others were not, uh, including uh, the one in which uh, we understood that the Eritrean troops who we uh, who have been reported to have committed many of the atrocities that we have seen committed there, that those yeah. troops would leave and they are still uh, there. Uh, the Secretary of State has appointed a special envoy for uh, the Horn, whose primary focus is to work on the situation in uh, uh, in Ethiopia. He just left the region. He met with the prime minister. He visited uh, Eritrea. Uh, he met with the president there for hours. Uh, and he is actively engaged with the situation on the ground. And then let me just bring it back home right here to New York, where we have engaged intensively on issues uh, related to Ethiopia. Uh, we have brought the issue to, to the council. I regret that the council has not yet had an open meeting on, on uh, Ethiopia. 
uh, but we have engaged on, on the issue and we were able to get out a statement on, on the situation so that at least without an open meeting uh, statement, let the people of Ethiopia who are the victims uh, of, uh, of the horrific uh, um, uh, human rights violations know that the international community had not forgotten them. Thank you, Ambassador. You know, uh, when uh, President Biden uh, said that America is back in the world, uh, it is a challenging world um, about policy, about policy. Um, it's not always a guarantee. Uh, let's take the example of peacekeeping operations, um, mm -hmm. uh, UN uh, peacekeeping operations. Let's take the example of the DRC, the, the Democratic Republic of Congo and the MONUSCO. Uh, not a single day, Ambassador, without Congolese populations uh, of the Eastern DRC protesting, asking that the MONUSCO peacekeepers leave, the, leave, the, leave their country, people continue to be killed. Why this part of the country, of, of this important country, the DRC, has been suffering so much 30 years despite the 20 year presence of the most important US peacekeeping crew. Um, and even despite Dr. Mukwege's Nobel Prize. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it's interesting you raised DRC. I was just discussing that uh, internally with uh, my staff today to say we need to focus uh, as uh, as the U.S. Prim Rep more attention on uh, what is happening in uh, the Democratic Republic of, of Congo. And it is my intention to focus uh, some of my effort and my voice on uh, the situation there. We need to have a better understanding of what is happening uh, as it relates to uh, the peacekeeping operation there and how we can ensure that that operation is more effective in addressing the needs of the people, particularly as it relates uh, to providing protection uh, to, uh, to the population there. And we need to have uh, more discussions with, uh, with leadership uh, in the country uh, to uh, impress upon them the importance of, of how uh, they should address uh, the needs of, of the people of, uh, of the DRC. Um, DRC is an extraordinarily wealthy country and you rarely hear people use the word wealthy when we uh, describe DRC, but it is extraordinarily wealthy. It has an abundance of natural uh, resources those natural resources are actually fueling the conflict uh, because they're not being harnessed for uh, the needs of the people for building uh, the country. Uh, see the movie uh, Rakanda, I think this is DRC. Uh, and I know it was an imaginary story, but imagine a DRC where the resources that are available there are being used uh, to build the country, are being used to educate the people, are being used to provide health care and services uh, for the people of DRC. And we would have a Wakanda in, in the making. And there's no reason DRC can't uh, achieve that. They have to make sure those resources that are there are being used for the people of DRC and not being used by those who uh, want to fuel war. Exactly, exactly. Um, Ambassador, we have just five minutes left, but um, before coming to the African-American diaspora and its link uh, with the African continent, what is very important to me and to you, I'm sure, I just would like to ask you a last question about the international affairs, affairs um, and particularly the question of the democratization of multilateral institutions. Um, you were talking about the, the African leadership uh, maybe the solution uh, of African problems could be African solutions. Um, African nations are 30% of, of UN voices and no permanent seat uh, at the Security Council. Um, they will be, we said that, with, they will be the largest population soon. What do you think of a permanent uh, seat um, on the UN Security Council for an African country? Which country um, African countries should occupy it, uh, Nigeria, um, South Africa, maybe Senegal, why not? A French-speaking country, 
do you think this classification of African countries may, may by language is relevant? But uh, it's up to you. You know, UN reform is uh, a very uh, uh, interesting topic here in New York because everybody talks about it, but uh, everybody has a different definition of what UN reform entails. Uh, and the, the question of whether there should be an African country on the UN Security Council, you know, my feeling is that's going to be a decision uh, that, and who that country should be, is going to be a decision that Africans themselves should make. And I will sit back and watch the discussion. I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not going to choose my ancestral uh, country in Nigeria <laughs> and the blood, not, flowing through, <laughs> the blood flowing through my veins. Uh, <laughs> and I know that Nigeria would say very quickly that, of course, we're the most populous country on the continent of Africa. We ought to be uh, the representative of Africa on the Security Council. Ethiopia might even make that argument as the second most populous uh, uh, country on the continent of Africa. South Africa, uh, a huge player on the continent, clearly believe that they should uh, play that role. And why not Senegal uh, as a French speaking country or Cote d'Ivoire? <laughs> That's going to be a question that will be extraordinarily difficult uh, to answer. But the broader question of UN reform, we all uh, support uh, having discussions that look at how we make the UN more effective and more responsive uh, and more efficient as an organization to address the uh, requirements that we all look to the UN uh, to do. And that's a conversation that takes place, I think, on, on almost a daily basis here in New York. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I think about Senegal that President Macky Sall may have hear you, may hear you on this. <laughs> but this conversation is really fascinating, Ambassador, uh, and we could take a very, you know, talk for a very long time. Uh, but there is something, a last question, something I don't want to miss. Um, it's about the link uh, between the African American diaspora and Africa. Uh, this link uh, must be one of the most tragic and fascinating stories in human human history. And yet so little is said about this singular link. Uh, you said you are an African woman. Uh, that's a lot for, for, African, for an African woman like me. And for, from Nkuma to Malcolm X, from Senghor to Webb Dubois, from Emi Césaire to Marcus Garvey, uh, Pan-Africanist leader on both sides of the Atlantic, you know, have dreamt of a convergence of, of, of the two trajectories um, what's left of that old dream? What do we expect from the African Union, for example, or from Africa in general about the African American community? We have yeah. a discussion about George Floyd death, uh, you know, a few months ago, and you told me very interesting things about this. You know, we're we're celebrating uh, uh, or commemorating that in a in a in a few days and. I have to tell you that the George Ford death was traumatizing uh, to our entire community because we had all experienced that uh, throughout our lives from uh, the Jim Crow era, from, from slavery through Jim Crow, uh, through the civil rights movement where uh, black men were uh, uh, violently uh, slaughtered. Uh, but we'd never seen it like we saw what happened to George Floyd. And uh, I, I think a couple of things happened there. For the first time, I actually heard Africans, African countries and African leaders actually issue statements on that. Now, George Floyd was not the first. Uh, and uh, sometimes I would be wondering where, are, where were the voices of Africans when uh, events taking place in the United States were affecting their, their descendants in, in this country. And we rarely heard those voices, but we did hear those voices after George Floyd. I think we have missed an opportunity uh, between uh, the African American, Africa diaspora community and the continent of Africa to really harness
relationships uh, to empower uh, each other. And I think we need to look for more opportunities to empower uh, African Americans who uh, really fill a very close and emotional uh, connection uh, to the continent of Africa. But we also don't always feel that Africa feels that com emotional uh, connection to, uh, to African uh, Americans. Uh, our, our bloodlines are linked uh, and they go back uh, the 400 years. And what we as African Americans are missing is who our bloodlines are. Uh, and so this DNA technology that has happened over the past 20 years has allowed some of us to at least tap into, in a very broad way, where we might have, uh, have, have come from. And that is very meaningful to all of us. It is very emotional uh, for uh, all of us. And I think the next step in that process is for the African continent to fully embrace their relatives uh, in the United States. You're absolutely right. You know, um, as a French uh, citizen as well, um, and member of the French diaspora, um, African diaspora there, we grew up with uh, all those names, not only George Floyd, but um, every year we, we, we did not ignore anything about the African-American diaspora. And we know everything about you, your heroes, your your survivors, your struggles, uh, 400, uh, you know, um, it's, it's, it's so long, so tiring. Um, but it is interesting to, to hear that the connection is being built between the continent and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a diaspora everywhere in the world, including the American diaspora. Ambassador, I have to, to stop there now because uh, you have a, uh, a heavy agenda, and I would like to thank you uh, for your generous time today. Um, it has been a, a privilege to have you uh, and to hear you, to hear you, your views on, on Africa and how how the continent fits into uh, the, the Biden's administration's plan. With you representing the United States at the UN, uh, there is much reason to be optimistic. Allow me um, to also thank our audience uh, for joining us um, for this Africa Day celebration. And uh, for your special, our special team and partners um, at the Africa Center, uh, which you've been introduced today. Um, as the center embarks on its new chapter, um, we hope, uh, we, we really hope uh, you continue to, to follow us, to follow for events and programming to come, uh, including um, those high level conversations. Um, and uh, until next time, um, thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you very much and congratulations on Africa Day. Thank you.